Okay, I think we'll get started. I want to apologize for the slight delay. We're all delighted to have you here this afternoon. Um, my whole team is very excited for this presentation. Um, some of you have been here before, many of you are new. And basically, this is kind of an informal presentation, trying to bring you the update of what's been going on in melanoma. Some of you are patients and know us. Uh, some of you know family members or friends who are patients. And yet there are some who are more interested in what's going on because you've either read about it in the papers or have you seen it on television. Certainly there are some recent changes that have been very exciting for us and we're going to try and share it with you today. Now, clearly one of the things about melanoma is the incidence is really increasing in the population. The biggest jump was right after World War II when there was more leisure and greater prosperity and people spent more time out in the sun. But more recently, if you notice, since 1985 on, the incidence in the population in the United States is doubling about every 15 years. Now, it's gone to the point that melanoma is now the number five um, most common malignancies that we see in the U.S. population if you combine males and females. Now, within this cancer center at Smilo, melanoma is actually one of the bigger cancers that we treat here. And one of the reasons for that is because of this entire team. We have about 35 clinicians who are dedicated for the care of melanoma patients. And we get together on a weekly basis. And we've been together for so long, we can very often complete each other's sentences. And we're very much like a family here. And you're going to get to meet many of those during this evening. And these are the individuals that you'll be seeing uh, making the presentations. Now, I'm going to ask you to hold on to your questions until the first session is over. And then you can ask the questions at that point. We'll cover all of the topics at that first session. Then we're going to have a break for some refreshments. And then for the second session, we'll wait until the end for the questions and answers, if that's all OK with you. I'd like to now present Samantha Guild, who is from AIM, one of our sponsors for this program. Well, I'm from New York, so I know how to speak loud. So, uh, <laughs> so first, I want to thank Smile Cancer Center and all of the presenters, and especially you, for coming today. It is so important for us, at least, to educate you so that you can have, you can be your own advocate. Um, when it comes to this disease, as well as helping those who are not able to attend. <coughs> um, I want to first um, introduce you to uh, Alicia Ra Rowell. Uh, she is our new VP at AIM. She just started. Um, so please, if you see her, please say hello. Um, we are really excited to, uh, for her to be part of the team. Um, I want to tell you a bit about AIM and melanoma. I know a few of you are familiar with us. For those of you who aren't, uh, we have the most comprehensive website on the disease. Everything from early detection, uh, prevention, to a lengthy discussion about what your diagnosis means, treatments that have been approved by the FDA uh, for the treatment of the disease, clinical trials, how to be your own advocate. Um, we have a Barbara who is our oncology nurse. You can reach her uh, toll free, you can email her so that we can help you and she can help you as well. Uh, public policy, we led the effort, started leading the effort and we continue to lead the effort to ban minors under 18. Started in California, Texas, uh, we supported the effort here in Connecticut. And I'm proud to say that now the uh, FDA is considering a nationwide ban under 18 on the devices. We work on oral parity legislation, biosimilar legislation, uh, we um, are, have a pa we are a patient. Okay, maybe I do need a speaker. <laughs> we are the pa <laughs> Sorry, I've been in California for a few years. I'll blame it on that. Um, we are the patient representative on the NCCN. They set the guidelines for the standard of care. We are the patient advocate for on the FDA panel. We have an international presence. We're very fortunate here in the US that there are patient advocates to help the melanoma community. There is very little being done so far on the international level, and we are changing that. 
We are working in Europe, Latin America, Australia to form advocacy groups for melanoma patients and their families, um, even or even in the Middle East. In research, we have a number of projects that are ongoing, and our, our, our biggest one is to create the first multi-site fresh frozen primary tissue bank. Um, and so certainly, these are all resources that we are doing to, working to help you get through uh, your journey and encourage you to reach out to us to let us know what more we can do. On the housekeeping end, um, it, you've all been given a folder, hopefully. In it is an agenda. There is an evaluation form. I encourage you to complete that form and get it back to us. And both, the or both groups will be sharing it. And we do look at them because I do tweak um, symposiums going forward at, at other cancer centers based upon what I hear. We have a brochure that, um, from AIM that talks about some of the things that I discussed. There is a quick reference wallet size card as well. You should also have in your folders either a pad of paper, index cards to write down your questions. I'll be moving around um, collecting those during the evening. I should let you know that we are videotaping the presentations this evening and uploading them onto YouTube. If you haven't done so already, please make sure that we have your email address so that we can send those links directly to you. We're also, uh, we'll be providing those on Facebook. So if you saw us earlier, uh, we were doing a live feed on Facebook because we educate through that social media and Twitter as well. Um, if you um, parked here, at the Cancer Center and have a, um, a voucher. We are validating your parking so that um, you do not have to incur that cost. Um, if you have any, if it, there are no questions, we will move forward into the presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Samantha. And we are very grateful for AIM for Melanoma for co-sponsoring this program with us over the years. I think we'll start with um, our first uh, speaker, Dr. Marius Null. Dr. Null is the co-director of the Melanoma Program, is a medical oncologist, and is world-renowned for a lot of contributions to melanoma. Mario. Thanks, Steve. Um, thanks, Steve. My, my job is to uh, um, to give you the, sort of the background to set up the stage for all the other speakers in the rest of the evening. I want to thank everybody for coming. I, I know many of you personally and those that I don't know. Uh, it would be a pleasure to meet you at, 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 uh, uh, here at this meeting. Um, let me just start with um, what melanoma looks like. So I almost never see a primary melanoma in the clinic, almost never, because when people come to me, their my melanoma has already been diagnosed by a dermatologist. Um, and, uh, and been taken out. So what I usually see is not a primary melanoma. I see the melanoma after it's metastasized. But this is what a melanoma looks like. This is from a textbook. Um, and uh, this is what uh, you would take to your primary care doctor or your dermatologist with a suspicion of, hey, this doesn't look right. And uh, primary melanomas uh, are asymmetric. So they, they um, what you can see here is they have irregular borders. They have irregular pigmentation here that you can see here. So there's asymmetry. So one half of the lesion doesn't look like the other half of the lesion. They're usually more than about half a, a, a centimeter in size. But what's most important is that they evolve over time. So most people, when we see them in the clinic, will say, this thing has been changing. It started to change or started to itch or started to bleed. And it doesn't look like my other moles. It's, it's funny looking. And that's usually the clue that that needs to be looked at by a dermatologist. Now, this is another melanoma here. This is on the skin. You can see, again, it has many of the features of melanoma. But I want to point out, and I, I try to make clear to uh, our, our patients in the clinic, is that melanomas can start anywhere in the body because melanomas start from melanocytes. I'll show you that in just a minute. Melanocytes are the cells in your body that give you normal skin pigmentation, and you have them everywhere in your body. So most melanomas occur in the skin. That's where you have most of the melanocytes, um, and are probably related to sun exposure. But melanomas can occur uh, in the back of the eye. They can occur in mucosal surfaces, so inside the nose. They can occur in the rectal and vaginal area. 
They can occur underneath the fingernail or between the webs of the toes or in the bottom of the feet. Now those that are not sun exposed lesions have a different biology. There are different kinds of melanomas. They start in the same cell, but they can behave differently um, in, in patients. So what exactly happens? So if we just look at sunlight as a damage, now we don't know what causes all melanomas, but the ones that are caused by sunlight, the point that I try and make is over years of, of sun exposure, the melanocyte, the normal cell, gets damaged. And when a cell gets damaged, primarily the DNA of that cell gets damaged. And that it turns, the, that damaged DNA it turns the melanocyte into a melanoma cell. So the melanoma starts from a normal cell type. So that, that DNA damage, DNA, as you know, is, is made into RNA, and that RNA is read by the cell and turned into a protein. But the damaged DNA, which makes damaged RNA, or uh, abnormal RNA, can result in a protein that's different than your normal protein. When that protein is different, it can have different properties. And so if you have more of a certain kind of protein in your cell, or less of a protein that you need, or a damaged protein, those, those, that gives the cell special properties, superpowers, I always call it in the clinic. And, and those superpowers are that it can, you can lead to increased and uncontrolled cell division. So that means that normally cells can only divide a little bit, but when they have this damage, they can divide more than normal. Um, you can see that it leads to resistance to cell death. So most cells, when they're abnormal, die. They're supposed to die. But cancer cells don't. They don't die. They continue to live. Um, these superpowers allow the cells to actually invade, to get out of the, the site where they belong, where they started, and get into the bloodstream, actually into two kinds of bloodstreams, the lymphatics, which means that they can travel from, let's say, a primary site in the skin to the lymph nodes that are closest by, or they can get into other kinds of blood vessels and travel beyond the lymph node to other organs. Now, when they travel from the primary site to other organs, that's called the metastasis, and that's called metastatic melanoma. And once they land in another place, they have the capacity to sit there. They can remain dormant. But eventually, they start to grow. And in order to grow, they need to be able to uh, call blood vessels in to, f to form blood vessels, right? Because you need to blood and, and oxygen for your tissues to grow. So it can form abnormal blood vessels. And the other thing that melanomas need to grow is they need to escape from the immune system because most the body knows, the body can, be, can recognize abnormal cells and can eliminate them. That probably is going on in your body all the time. But for a cancer to develop, the cancer has to figure out a way to turn off the immune system so that it can continue to grow. In fact, one of the bases, the most important treatment that we have for melanoma is actually getting the immune system to recognize the cancer cells again. So what's the natural history? What, what happens? So, you start with a primary tumor, so that's, that's the, the first melanoma, like the one that I showed you on the skin. Uh, and as I said, it can occur in multiple places. But generally, the first place that it likes to go, the first place it invades into, is the local lymphatic. So that means that it travels to the lymph nodes closest to the site of where that melanoma is. Possibly at the same time, it's traveling to other places in the body, but the first one we usually detect is in the local lymph nodes. The, um, um, when it travels to other organs, when it, when it lands in the lung or the liver or the brain or the bone, it doesn't necessarily grow right away. It can remain dormant for years, in some cases for months. In some cases, we've seen people where their primary melanoma was 25 years ago, and now they're presenting with metastatic disease. And we still, to this day, do not understand why a cell can sit in your body for 25 years and not grow and then start to grow 25 years later. And in fact, that's one of the things that we're, we're, we're going to want to investigate because if we could understand what that mechanism is, we could then kill those cells before they, they start to grow later on. So um, when I see somebody in the clinic that's already been to the dermatologist or to Dr. Arian or to Dr. Han or Dr. Narayan, they come to me usually after their melanomas, the primary melanoma has been resected, and the, and the lymph nodes, if necessary, have been resected also. And, the, um, and usually, when people have a primary melanoma, even if it's spread to the lymph node, at, at that initial presentation, we generally can't find disease in other parts of the body. Even if the cells are there, even if they're sitting in the lung, the liver, the PET scan and the CAT scan won't find those cells. But they may be at risk for developing that disease later on. 
And so we, we look for risk factors to try and determine how likely it is that there are cells other places in the body and it might start to grow later on. And we look for thickness, how thick the melanoma is. We do that under the microscope. We look to see whether the surface of the skin where the melanoma is has been eroded. That's called ulceration. And we look to see whether the, the lymph nodes closest to the melanoma are involved. And we put all that together and decide what the risk is um, for disease showing up in the future. Now, why do people get sick from metastatic melanoma? Well, they get sick because if those cells in other parts of the body start to grow, they can do one of two things. They can destroy a vital organ. If you lose your liver, you can't survive that. That's, that's a terrible thing. Or sometimes enough melanoma is growing in the body that it produces substances that make you sick, that make you wither, and make your organs fail. And those are the things, not just for melanoma, for any kind of cancer, that makes cancer dangerous and can lead to death. And if you have enough melanoma in your body, you're going to have symptoms. You're going to either have pain from where the melanoma might sit, or fatigue, or you might lose your appetite, you might lose weight, or you might start having fever. And those are the symptoms that alert us, in some cases, that something is going on. So when I see people in the clinic, they generally have a limited number of questions. If they don't have those questions, I actually give them the I answer these questions anyway. And the question is, gosh, I've had a primary melanoma. It's been taken out. But what's the risk that at some point in the future it might show up in other organs? And we try and answer that question in the clinic. And, and the second question people ask is, if, if I do have a risk, is there anything I can do to lower my risk? Is there some drug that I can take? that will kill the cells before they start to grow in the future. And that's called adjuvant therapy because it's done adjuvant to, to the surgery. And another question that people ask is, gee, if I'm at risk, how will you monitor me? How will you um, find out if the disease does come back? Because if a lesion shows up in the lung or the liver, you may not feel that. And so we want to detect that as early as possible so we can give effective treatment. And then. Um, People want to say, is there anything I can do? What should I look for myself? Because I'm only going to see you every three months or every six months. So is there something I should be doing in the interim to look for recurrence? And then, of course, the big question, and uh, the biggest question is, can you do anything to treat my disease if it recurs? And the answer to that is yes. And that's the reason why we look hard to see if it recurs before you develop symptoms from it. And then the other question, which I can never answer in the clinic, is, is there anything else that I can do to lower my risk? Are there diet or lifestyle things or supplement or some exposure or anything else that I can do to lower my risk of recurrence? And the answer to that is we don't have a lot of data. So we don't have a lot of the answers to sort of lifestyle changes that you might make that would reduce your risk. Certainly, we want you to stay out of the sun, not because it would reduce the risk of metastatic disease, but it might reduce the risk that you might develop another primary. And if you have one melanoma, as Dr. Arian will, will, will surely tell you, you have some risk, a small risk, of developing a second primary melanoma in the future. So what does metastatic melanoma look like? So um, I'm just going to show you a couple of slides. Everybody's is a little bit different. But this is um, a, a metastatic lesion in the liver, huge metastatic lesion in the liver. And in 10 years ago or 20 years ago, this would have a very poor prognosis. We can treat this now, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But this is what it would look like. And you can see the normal, just to show you, this is normal liver here. And these, these, these areas here that have lower attenuation are, are the areas of metastases. And this is one of the banes of our existence, but we can now treat this effectively also in many patients. These are brain metastases. So these, these little spots here are areas of melanoma that have traveled to the brain and are growing in the brain. And in melanoma, more so than almost any other cancer, maybe more than any other cancer, there's a propensity for cells to travel to the brain and, and grow in the brain. And actually, Dr. Kluger, one of my colleagues, has developed a very large research program to figure out why this is true in melanoma and how to treat this even more effectively than we're treating it now. So how do we approach metastatic disease? So if somebody comes in and we suspect they have metastatic disease, what do we do? Well, we first we have to stage, right? We have to know everywhere the disease is. So that's why we say we need to get a CAT scan of the body. Usually we do a CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, or a brain MRI. And that's to try and document all the sites of disease before we start the treatment. Almost always when somebody presents with these lesions, if we don't, haven't confirmed that it's melanoma, we don't just guess. 
we send you back to the surgeon or to the radiologist to get a piece of that tissue to confirm that it is melanoma because every once in a while when we see lesions in the lung and the liver, it turns out to be something else. Sometimes it turns out to be benign, and we certainly don't want to be treating people with these drugs if they don't really have cancer. We take some of the tumor and we send it for mutational analysis, so that means that we send it to the lab and they do a very sophisticated molecular test to find out whether they have these mutations that I talked to you about earlier before, to find out whether you have a mutation that might be driving the cancer because this might give us a clue as to how to treat the cancer later on. Now we have drugs that can hit those mutations, turn those mutations, those mutated proteins off, and sometimes the cells don't like those drugs and they die and we get very effective treatment in that setting. We take a medical history to make sure that uh, for the treatment that we're going to give, that there are no contraindications, meaning that the treatment won't do harm, for example. There are some kinds of immune therapies that we can't give if you already have some sort of autoimmune disease, uh, and so we, we look for that. We certainly want to control pain. Some people will have pain from their disease, and it's very hard to treat people with medications if they're not comfortable, if they're not feeling well. So we try and give them medications for pain, and sometimes before we even give medicine systemically, meaning by mouth or by, by vein, to try and get all the cancer cells, there's something that's growing that we need to take out because if we don't take it out right away, it's going to cause problems. So we either treat that with surgery or radiation first before we go on to the systemic uh, treatment. And then the next step is if, if we think there are cancer cells in multiple places in the body, we need to pick the best treatment for that individual, and that's usually something by mouth or by, by vein. So, so how do we treat metastatic disease? Well, there's really two approaches. Sometimes if you just have one lesion, that's a metastasis, a single thing that shows up in the lung, sometimes we'll just take it out because even though there's a high risk that something will show up someplace else, sometimes just taking out that lesion, there won't be any recurrences for many, many years. So surgery can be an appropriate treatment even for people who present with an area of metastatic disease. But for the most part, if somebody has disease in the lungs or the liver or other places, we don't do surgery, we don't do radiation, we treat them with systemic therapy. And what that means is a pill or something by vein, because we're trying to get all the cells everywhere in the body. We can't just cherry pick one thing at a time because it's not only the things that we see that are dangerous, it's the things that we don't see yet that haven't started to grow that can be a problem in the future. And so what are the options? And you'll hear more about this later, but there's really two options. If there's a mutation, for example, in this protein BRAF, we can give a targeted therapy. We give a special drug that hits that mutated protein and turns it off. And in some cases, we see very dramatic responses. And you see here to the two examples that we have for targeted therapies. But if there's no mutation, or even if there is a mutation, we often go to immune therapies. Because immune therapies, therapies which can turn on your immune system in very sophisticated ways, can cure melanoma. And in fact, we think that the current immune therapies that we have available now, some of which we help to develop here, could cure in patients with metastatic disease, maybe up to 40, maybe in the future up to 50% of people who have metastatic disease. So we're very excited about this therapy, and these are the therapies that we usually go to first in our, um, in our institution. Now, there are some doctors in the community that will give the targeted therapies first, but we generally don't do that unless there's a contraindication to the immune therapy. And the factors that we use to decide which ones to give include whether we can cure the, 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 the disease or not. Sometimes we, we have to give the targeted therapies because they tend to work a little bit faster, and we give those first, and then we go to the immune therapies later. But we also look to see whether anything that we might do, whether you might have something that might be a contraindication. You might be on another drug that might interact in a bad way with the drugs that we're going to give. And we have to get all that information and then make a decision about which treatment to give. In some cases, we use social factors. So if somebody lives by themselves and they live very far away, that might change the, uh, uh, the decision we make about which therapy to give. So just a few things to understand about these therapies. Targeted therapies, so the ones, remember, the ones that target the mutations, not the immune therapies, they work very fast. In, in most patients, the majority of patients, their disease will shrink very quickly. Sometimes we can see it the next day or within days in the clinic. 
The problem is that most of those responses don't last forever. So they're not cures. And people have to stay on those drugs because if they don't, the disease can grow back. On the other hand, the immune therapies can produce very long-term responses. But unlike the, the, the common thinking that immune therapies are, don't have any side effects, these immune therapies can have very severe side effects because they activate your immune system to attack your normal tissues. We can reverse that, but people can get very sick and they can die of toxicities from these drugs. So these are not uh, completely safe drugs. But if you give an immune therapy and if it works and we get people through it, we think we can cure people with metastatic melanoma. And we th I think we're doing this all the time. Um, even if they have lots and lots of disease, there's a a, 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 a sort of a myth out there that if you have lots of cancer, we can't cure it, and that's not true. We cure people who have very extensive melanoma with the immune therapies. Um, when we give combinations of immune therapies, it's more toxic than the single drugs. You've probably heard of Optivo and Keytruda. They're very well tolerated. They work very well as immune therapies. When we combine that with this drug, your voice can be more toxic, but it can also be more effective. And even if you uh, can receive targeted therapy first, as I said, we tend to go with the immune therapies first because they can produce those long-term remissions. Now, one more myth that I want to dispel is that if you get an immune therapy and you have one thing that's starting to grow, everything else is shrinking and one thing is starting to grow, people say, oh, that's not good. The therapies are going to stop working. In fact, what we've learned is that when we use immune therapies, they may be able to get rid of 90% of the disease, but one or two things may be left behind that are resistant and can grow. And we can then either radiate that or take those lesions out and still produce long-term remission. So um, these therapies work. They may not work on every uh, melanoma cell that you have in your body, but we can uh, uh, treat a lot of them effectively. So this is just a survival, just a, an example. And I just want just to focus, this is for your voy alone, and this is what we had to work with just a few years ago. Now, when we give uh, a drug like um, uh, nivolumab or Obdivo, the five-year survival now is up to 35%. That used to be 5 or 10% 15 years ago. And now that we're giving the combination therapies, we expect that the long-term survival here will be in the range of somewhere to 40 to 50%. That's remarkable. That's a tenfold increase in five-year survival compared to where before. Now, that's scary. I know that's scary to you to understand that, but it's important for you to understand what the prognosis is for patients with metastatic melanoma, and also to understand that there's hope. There's a 50% chance, possibly, of long-term survival. Um, uh, even if you develop metastatic with ease with melanoma, 10 times better prognosis than there was even 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so um, I just want to end. I have a couple more minutes, Steve. No? Okay. <laughs> Sometimes it takes longer to explain these concepts than, than we anticipate. Look, I, I just want to, I'm going to take two more minutes. I just want you to understand why we do research. The, we, 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 we've made enormous advances, but we, we're not there yet. We need to really learn more about the disease and the drugs that we use the disease in order to improve the treatment. So we need to understand the biology of cancer. We need to understand what the drugs are doing, why they work, why they don't work. Um, we need to develop biomarkers so we can pick the right drugs for the right patients. And, and we, need to, we, we, we want to be at a point where we cure everybody with no toxicity. And until we get to that point, we really need to do research. This is work done here, a number of mutations that we've identified. The more work we do to identify the biology, um, the more likely we are to develop effective treatments. And Ruth Halliban and others in our group have actually published more on the mutational analysis of melanoma than almost anybody else in the world. And this may lead to new treatments. I can't go through this in detail because we don't have time. We're working very hard on developing immune therapies. We have many ideas about how to make the immune therapies we have now, which are very effective, even more effective, and lots of ideas and lots of clinical trials that are coming down the road. And you'll hear more about that from other people. And I want to just stop here with the people in our group that, that um, make this all possible, um, the surgeons, Dr. Arian, Dr. Han, uh, uh, Dr. Narayan. We work with the neurosurgeons like Dr. Chang, who treats the brain lesions. We have radiation therapists who are outstanding, world-class people that help us in, in doing our job every day. You'll hear from Dr. Kluger. We have a new faculty member, Sarah Weiss, that just joined us, a young person from NYU who we think is going to be absolutely fabulous. Um, 
our research nurses, many of you have met them in the clinic, Amanda, Elizabeth, and we work with project managers who have to get these protocols going, and a whole host of laboratory scientists that are doing the work that we hope will advance um, this treatment. And of course, last, and I wouldn't, uh, would, um, I have to mention our nursing staff who, who really, you know, work hard to, to take care of people like Lauren and Laura and Destiny, all of whom you've, you've interacted with uh, in the clinic. So I'm going to stop there and, and thank you for your attention. Okay, the train has left the station and is rolling along, so we're going to try and see if we can catch up. Our next speaker is Jonathan Leventhal uh, from Dermatology, who's going to be talking about some of the uh, risk factors and predispositions of melanoma. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay, we'll try my best. I'm Jonathan Leventhal. I'm the dermatologist of the Melanoma Group. Delighted to talk to you tonight about melanoma risk factors, predisposition, um, the genetics, and I'm also going to talk about the skin exam for a few minutes. So we'll start with the risk factors. So there's two types of risk factors when it comes to developing a cancer, including melanoma. Those that we can control that are environmental, and those that we can control that are hereditary or genetic. And while it's lovely to look like Julianne Moore, believe it or not, as you'll hear later, she does have many risk factors for developing melanoma that she can control. So we'll start off by talking about the environmental risk factors. And with this, we're going to focus mostly on ultraviolet or UV radiation. So UV radiation is emitted from the sun, and the rays hit the Earth's surface, and they also can penetrate the skin. So the two UV rays that are the biggest factors include UVA and UVB. And UVA, while it penetrates deeper, um, and is the majority of rays uh, that penetrate the Earth's surface, is important. In addition, UVB is thought to be um, very important in sunburn. And we know that, as, as we heard earlier, that these rays cause DNA damage and ultimately cause cancer. And I wanted to draw your attention to this picture here, because not everybody knows that UVA rays penetrate the window. So even when you think you're safe driving in your car, as you can see in this photo, you can actually develop a lot of sun damage over time, and I see this a lot in practice. And I wanted to show you, to show you this picture. Notice the difference in skin that's protected from the sun and skin that over time has a lot of exposure. And notice all these yellow spots or solar lenticos that develop. So along the lines of UV radiation, our research has shown us that the type of sun exposure that is attributable to developing melanoma is unfortunately the type that we love the most. The type on vacations, outdoor activities, physical activities, sports, and short bursts of intermittent sun exposure are actually responsible for a majority of melanomas. That's not to say that cumulative sun damage isn't important as well, and it is, in particular with certain types of melanoma that develop on the head and neck, and particularly in older individuals called lentigo maligna melanoma. And recent evidence has shown us that it's not just childhood sun damage that matters. We now know that it's sunburns that develop in adolescence and in adulthood that all contribute to melanoma. And the more sunburns you get, the higher your odds are of developing melanoma. But childhood sunburns matter as well. So if you have five blistering sunburns in childhood, your lifetime risk increases 80%. So it's very significant. But a point that I want to make here is that even though a lot of damage may be done, you can still do things to prevent further damage and further uh, risk of developing melanoma. So I think every tanning bed should be equipped with this nice machine before you enter, and you just get to select which, which type of skin cancer you'd like. And, and hopefully that, among other uh, you know, efforts by AIM Melanoma, will help to reduce it. So let's see how the audience does with some questions. One, research has found that indoor tanning is great. It protects against sunburns. True or false? false. Correct. While you might tan faster, you get more sun damage and increased risk. Okay, two, women with melanoma, younger women in particular, are six times more likely to report tanning. True or false? True, that's correct. And a large study out of Minnesota recently uh, supported this. And the third one's um, sort of uh, an easy one. Indoor tanning is categorized by the World Health Organization as high as cancer risk factor. So what can we do to prevent melanoma? So there's two types of prevention. Primary prevention to prevent the development of the cancer and secondary prevention to detect and treat cancer earlier on. So there's one great study out of Australia that was randomized and controlled and it's the best evidence to date that regular use of sunscreen can significantly reduce the risk of melanoma. 
and those patients that use sunscreen regularly developed half as many melanomas in the follow-up period. I also wanted to dispel some myths about sunscreen. While the skin is important at producing vitamin D, there's no studies that show that if you use sunscreen regularly, you're going to become vitamin D deficient. Vitamin D is readily available in the diet. And so, and so you don't have to worry about becoming vitamin D deficient. And two, if it's cloudy outside, still significant rays reach the Earth's surface and may cause sunburns. So even on a cloudy day or a cold day, it's important to use sunscreen. And I won't spend too long talking about sunscreen facts, but the SPF basically measures how well a sunscreen can prevent ultraviolet damage from the skin. And so for instance, so what does SPF 15 mean? It, it means that if normally you would go outside unprotected and start to turn red in 20 minutes, well with SPF 15, it would prevent this redness for 15 times longer. So that's what it basically means. And I just wanted to make the point that it's important to use appropriate amount of sunscreen. So I think we're all familiar with a, a shot glass. And so to, to cover your exposed areas, you want to use one full shot glass full of sunscreen. And studies show us that uh, most individuals do not use the right amount. Actually, they use half of what is recommended. And it's important to reapply every couple of hours, especially after swimming or sweating. And you want to use a broad spectrum sunscreen, as many of you know. SPF 30 is, is probably all you need. And also, waterproof is, is no longer um, used. The FDA has removed that because you need to reapply the sunscreen after being in the water. There's water-resistant sunscreen, which remains effective in water for about an hour and a half, but yet then you need to reapply it. So I'll talk a little bit about um, what predisposes us to getting melanoma that we can control. So having a lot of moles is actually the number one um, inherent or a risk factor that you can control. And we know that it could increase your risk by 10 times. Also having irregular moles or multiple sunspots also increases your risk. And these risk factors, are, um, they multiply if you, have mul if you have both of them. Now while anybody can get melanoma, light skin, dark skin, we do know that if you have fair skin, freckles, red hair, light eyes, you're more likely to develop melanoma. And for better or for worse, you can choose your family, but, but you can choose the type of you know, sunscreen you use. And so if mother, father, sister, or brother, a first degree relative has melanoma, well, that will double your risk and you can't do anything about that. Um, and also if you've had a history of melanoma, and we spoke about this earlier for a bit, um, you have almost a 10 times increased risk of getting another melanoma. And what's fascinating about this is second melanomas can occur up to 20 years after your primary melanoma. So it's important to continue screening. So now next I'll talk about mutations and genetics, um, just, just for a bit, because you're going to hear a lot more about it later from the researchers. So there's families of individuals that have melanoma, and they pass it on from generation to generation. And it's called familial atypical multiple mole melanoma syndrome. And basically, these families, these individuals, have hundreds of atypical appearing moles. And their lifetime risk for getting melanoma can be over 60%, so very significant. There's many genes that are implicated. You'll hear more about them later. Um, but what I wanted to point out is that a lot of other cancers are associated um, in addition to melanoma. And pancreatic cancer in particular may be high, almost up to 20% in some individuals. Another cancer syndrome that you may have heard of before is the hereditary breast cancer and ovarian cancer syndrome with the BRCA1 and 2 gene mutations. And I have a lot of patients in our clinic who we screen because there's also increased risk of melanomas as well. And I think the main point that I wanted to, to take, you know, if you guys to take away here before the researchers talk more about this, is that different types of genetic mutations are associated with different types of melanoma. So for instance, the most common genetic mutation, BRAF, occurs in 50% of melanomas, in particular melanomas that occur in areas that are not chronically sun damaged, like the chest, the back, the legs, and they're associated with the most common type of melanoma, which I'll show you a picture of. And what's fascinating is that we're entering an era where oncologists and researchers work together to personalize the type of therapy you're going to get, as Dr. Schnall uh, was referring to earlier, and you hear more about that later. And then last, lastly, in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to present some new evidence for, for what, what can you do? What can you do as patients to, to screen yourself? So this just came out a couple months ago in a big dermatology journal. And what it showed is that patients with melanoma and their partners can learn how to perform skin exams and can detect melanoma at, at very high rates. So once a month checks of your skin by patients and their partners detected many melanomas as opposed to those who didn't test their, check their skin regularly, just sort of periodically looked. 
and they didn't find any melanomas. So we know that, that, we, that something can be done. Um, you can be proactive about uh, looking at your own skin. And Dr. Schnoll spoke about this earlier. So here are some other pictures highlighting what melanoma might look like. And I think the most important point is evolution, anything that's changing or becomes symptomatic in any way. And there's another sign that I think is very helpful, and I think a picture illustrates it better. That's the ugly duckling sign. I tell all my patients about the ugly duckling sign. And what that means is that patients have what's called a signature mole. It's the type of mole that they develop. And so, for instance, here, this individual has many light brown moles. Some are larger, some are smaller. And then right in the middle is a perfectly symmetrical, perfectly uniform, darker mole. It just doesn't look like any other moles. It looks pretty good. It's not asymmetrical, the border's fine, the color's pretty good, it's a little bit darker, but it's uniform, it hasn't been changing, but it's, it's different. And so this is the melanoma. So I think that's the important point that I want you guys to know. You want to look for a lesion that doesn't belong. And then for a demonstration of, of, what to, of how to examine your partner's skin, has some volunteers. So it's important to look at places where you might not normally look. You want to look through the hair. Sometimes even the blow dryer helps to look through the hair and the scalp. You want to lift the breasts up and you want to look under the breast. You want to make sure you look under the toes, under the toenails. You want to look in the armpits. And the genitals. We find melanomas even in the genitals. So you want to look, you want to spread the buttocks as well. That was a great, uh, great dem demonstration. Okay, in closing, closing slide. So take home points. I wanted to uh, convey the message that, that we, can do, we can do things to prevent the development of melanoma. We can reduce our uh, sun exposure. We can try to avoid the sun during midday hours. That's not very reasonable. So we can wear hats, we can wear sunscreen, we can wear sun protective clothing, uh, sunglasses, and uh, we can see a dermatologist for screening, and most importantly, be an advocate for your own skin. Anything new changing, um, report it to your doctor, look for the ugly duckling, and I wanted to thank my colleagues and thank you guys for coming. Now you can see why I come every year, because every time I come, I learn something new. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Dr. Narayan, uh, uh, who's supposed to give the talk uh, today, is uh, out of countries in Asia, so he couldn't make it to the meeting. So, uh, I'll be talking to you a little bit about surgery. So, I want to assure you that I'm not going to show you any gory pictures. There's not going to be blood and guts all over the place. I tried to tone it down as much as I could. You've seen this before on um, publications as well as presentations tonight. One of the most important things I think we need to stress to you is that when you look at any of these things about melanoma, all of these are also seen in normal moles. So just seeing something that has a regular border or has a couple of different colors doesn't necessarily mean it's malignant, but it just means that you need to go and see somebody to have it check it out. Probably the most important thing of all is evolution, as was mentioned by Dr. Leventhal. And the one thing that we can say that you have to worry about is when you see areas of depigmentation where you had a mole and it's starting to go away, it's a reflection of your body's defense trying to destroy it. And that's the most meaningful thing. If you see something changing, go and have it checked out. So very briefly, I'm going to go through a few things. This is the skin as we look under the microscope. And if we look at this portion, that's the junction between the first and the second layer of the skin, and magnify it under the microscope, we see that on the bottom of these big round cells, those are the basal cells. And the cells that are further up in the skin are very flat cells, and those are called squamous cells, because squamous means flat. And then the dark ones you see that are producing pigment on the bottom are the melanocytes. Therefore, any cell in the skin can turn malignant. The most common are basal cells. They make up about 80% of all skin cancers. Squamous cells make up 15%. Melanomas only make up 5% of all the skin cancers. But as opposed to melanoma, basal cells and squamous cells rarely, rarely, less than 1% or 0.1% do spread 
to the lymph glands or it spread from the original site. They're very curable. But the longer the patient waits, the more difficult it is to take care of it surgically. So the first question that comes up, since the melanoma is a pigment producing cell, is it safe to do a biopsy? Is it safe when the dermatologist says they're going to shave it or do a punch or cut a piece of it out as opposed to taking the whole thing out? There was a concern a few decades ago that if we do cut into it, that it gets into the bloodstream because it bleeds and cancer cells are going to spread. And some studies that were done about well, close to 50 years ago showed there was absolutely no truth to that. Whether the patients had the biopsies, didn't have the biopsies, the cure rates were not altered at all. So it's very important, very safe to get a biopsy because the biopsy gives us a lot of information that lets us know what the next step should be. In other words, one of the things we found is the thicker the primary melanoma, the higher the probability that we may find cancer cells in the lymph glands. And that tells us that in those patients beyond a certain amount, we need to begin to look at the possibility of involvement in the lymph glands, which we'll talk about later on. So, one of the things it does do, it gives us the classification. You don't need to know anything about this other than the fact that in our brains, we have all this running around all the time. So when we see these reports from the biopsy, clinical examination, it gives us probabilities of risk to give you some advice as to what needs to be done. The most important thing is we need to get rid of the primary melanoma. The question is how much should we take around it? The thing is we can see the cancer cells in the center. But how many cancer cells have walked away from home? And that's what we don't know by looking at it. Now, I am showing you this picture because this comes from the days when I was doing residency training. And this is what we used to do. We used to take huge amounts. And to put it in perspective, let me tell you that about 20 to 40 years before my training, Patients with a melanoma of the extremity used to have it amputated. Well, we found out that that did not increase the cure rate. So there was no point in taking out a leg. So the question is, now, do we need to take that much or can we take a lesser amount? Because we don't want to do anything that's deforming. So there are a number of studies that were done to look at the possibility that we can have cancer cells that have walked away from the original cluster in Okay, so the concept to think about is the more we do, whether it's in diameter, depth, or multiple treatments, the higher the probability that we're going to achieve our goal, but at a price. And the price may be time, it may be effort, it may be complications, it may be bleeding, it may be dollars, it may be hospitalization. And so we have to weigh the advantages and disadvantages. So clinical trials were done in different parts of the world, in Europe, different areas of Europe, United States, and the WHO, the World Health Organization, began to look at, with the consent of the patients, comparing wide excision, long radius from the side of the melanoma to shorter radius to see whether or not it made a difference in cure, did it make any difference in local recurrence. And we found, based on different amounts looking at different radii and different thicknesses, we came to the conclusions that these were more reasonable amounts to go around it. So we take much less, and the amount we take is based on the thickness, which is the reason why it's important for us to get the biopsy to know where we're starting. So looking at this, what we say is the more we do, the more risk we have, so instead of taking out these huge amounts that require skin grafts, immobilization, big dressings, and time for it to heal, we now have come back with a concept that what we need to do is completely excise the melanoma cells and hopefully enough of a radius that we've taken care of the daughter cells that have walked away without having some of the complications as you can see here. So here's an example of a patient that came in with a deep melanoma, needed a wide excision, not as much as you saw during my training days, but we're trying to do things that are meaningful and effective, and in a situation like that, we can use local tissue, it's called flaps, 
So we don't need to use skin grafts. And we can close everything up at one stage. The patient can bathe starting the next day, although we don't like them in a tub, but they can shower, they can get soap and water on it. And this is about 10 days after surgery where everything has come together very nicely. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some examples of difficult things that we've evolved into and done very safely. We showed about 30 years ago that using flaps instead of skin grafts were just as safe. We did not increase the risk of recurrences and that's what makes it very valid. So what we're trying to do is avoid situations like this where patients have bald spots. Now if a patient is already bald, they may not mind having a skin graft, but most people would rather not. So in a situation like this, instead of putting a skin graft, we use multiple local flaps to put everything together. So in this man, where the area of the surgery was shaved, you can see that about 10 days later when the stitches come out, all the hair is beginning to grow. Now some of you may not see in the back, but the hair is growing already by 10 days. And when you have a woman where you have to shave the area, obviously we don't want to leave a bald spot on the top of the head. So by using these concepts of using flaps, we can then have the entire head of hair completely grow back in this same patient that you see over here. So large areas can be taken care of with local flaps. Smaller areas, instead of amputating fingers, we found that as long as you go wide and deep and take all that out, you can go ahead and put a small skin graft over the area and get the area to completely heal, saving the full length, full sensation, and dexterity of the fingers. Again, in another example where the pad is very important, we can again use it to get a perfectly normal looking finger. So let me go on into some more smaller areas that we've made advances in, in reconstructing. So this is a patient who had a melanoma where a portion of the ear was removed, very curative, very helpful, but at the same time, the patient is not very happy with it. But we have other ways we can deal with it now. One of the things we can do is as we resect that area, what we can do is, re whoops, sorry, we can reconstruct the area by taking this triangle of skin out, visualize it as separating all the skin from the back of the ear and rolling it up to reconstruct that helix again. And by doing just that, we can basically bring it back, make an ear again, so that afterwards, this is about 10 days after surgery, what we have is a normal looking ear, but it isn't the same, sorry. Every time I'm pushing the laser, I'm pushing the other button. But what we see is by sacrificing some of the lobule so that the, the lobule isn't there, we have a normal looking ear. The other advantage is nobody sees both the ears at the same time on somebody. You either see the left or the right. And as long as it looks normal, nobody will perceive that this is changed. Okay, more s complicated areas of wide resection where we have very little tissue left, we can still release that lid and reconstruct it so that in this very attractive young lady, she has a normal looking lower lid again. We can do that on larger areas of the cheek where significant amounts have to be removed. Again, using local tissue, you can see that this area can be completely reconstructed in one stage to make it appear normal again. We can do that with large areas of the nose, and I'm going through rapidly here because the only thing, you don't need to know the techniques, but rather that when you have a diagnosis of a melanoma, the first thing the patient is most afraid of is they're gonna look deformed. You don't have to worry about looking deformed. We can make things look relatively normal again, although it depends on the patient's perception. Now, I have many patients that come and say, and so is Dr. Hahn and the others that say, I'm not vain, I am not worried about the scars, just do what you have to do. And the first office visit, they come in for the stitches come out, they wanna know, when is the scar gonna go away? <laughs> So it's important for you to know that we can make things look relatively the same as it was preoperatively. And again, I'm showing you multiple examples to show that these are not unique. These are common results that we can get nowadays. And I'm not trying to present you my skills. This is anybody 
who's working with melanomas can do this. There's nothing magical about anything I do. The most important thing, though, is that although we can take care of the side of the primary and resurface and make things look normal again, what we have to think about is even if we don't feel enlarged lymph glands, the thicker the melanoma, the higher the probability of lymph gland being involved. And that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about later on when we talk about subtle node biopsies, and that's going to be coming uh, next. Now, one of the things that you also need to know that was alluded to in some uh, presentation earlier by Dr. Schnall that's going to be talked about later on by Dr. Kluger is that we can now basically personalize the cancer care for the patients depending on what criteria we find about the cancer. We no longer do what we used to have where patients, when they had recurrences, they had chemotherapy that basically attacked normal cells and cancer cells, and that's why patients had so many side effects. Now we can begin to identify where the problem is, what is the defense the cancer has made, that we can go in and block the defense of the cancer cell so the body's immunity can go ahead and take care of it. Before I finish, I just want to point out one more thing. One of the things that um, patients worry about is, and the most common concern we get from a frantic patient is, this was biopsied two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I need to be seen right away. And then they're told, well, we don't have an opening for two weeks, and, and that makes the patient very distressed. And it's important for you to understand that the urgency is not for the cancer, the urgency is for the patient. So for you to understand is let's talk about a little bit about arithmetic from, um, from grammar school days. If you look at a dandelion very close, you can see it. But if you're looking at a large plot or if you're looking at an acre of the backyard that's mowed, you're not going to see that dandelion. So if somebody has one cancer cell, there's no test that's ever going to be able to show it. So maybe you've heard about the dog that was so good that it could actually sniff melanoma in patients and actually went and would sniff and find it. We're talking about billions of cells. There is no <laughs> test, CAT scan, or immunologic test we have yet that will pick up anything that, that small. So the smallest thing we can detect is something about a gram. Think of something about the size of a pea. And a gram of tissue in the body, just about any tissue, is about a billion cells, 10 to the ninth cells. So if a cancer cell that makes a copy of itself, it's called doublings. One becomes 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. And if you keep doubling to get to a point where you have a billion dandelions, well, you're not going to see a green lawn. It's going to be a yellow lawn. And that makes it easy because then we can see the cancer. So the thing for, you, for the patients to understand is that when you look under a microscope, if one out of 10 cells are cancer cells, we can see it, either in the microscope and very often we can see it on the skin. But if only one out of 100 is cancer cells, we're not going to be able to see it. And if it's one out of 1,000 is a cancer cell, we won't even see it under the microscope. And one one thousandth of a billion is a million cancer cells. So if the cancer cells are not together and they're spread evenly in the tissue, we're not going to be able to see it. So how long does it take cancer cells to double and make copies of itself? Well, it varies from cancer type to cancer type. So you can see here that in um, breast, it's about a median of 120 days of melanoma. It's a little bit faster. And if you then do the arithmetic of 30 doublings and using that, the average time that somebody has had the earliest, most curable breast cancer, it's been there 2 to 17 years, mathematically before the diagnosis could be made. And for melanoma, it's 2 to 7 years. Now, I'm not telling you that if you get a diagnosis of a melanoma, you have a biopsy, you should go on a cruise and come back and take care of it later on. What I'm trying to tell you is if it takes a week or two weeks to get the appointment, take your time, make sure that you feel comfortable and confident with the doctors taking care of you. And if you're not, then go see somebody else. Get a second opinion. 
It is important that you're comfortable in what's being done and what's being recommended to you and not panic that I have no choice. This has to be done right away. Okay? Thank you very much. And I think we'll go on to the next speaker. <laughs> Dr. Hahn is a surgeon who's going to be talking about sentinel lymph nodes. All right. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to present tonight. Uh, it's truly a pr uh, privilege to be able to, uh, to speak at this symposium. So I'll be talking about surgical treatment reasons for sentinel node biopsy. Um, as uh, you've seen in prior talks, there are several prognostic features that have been correlated with melanoma specific survival. One of the most important is uh, the thickness or how deep that melanoma is going into the underlying tissues. There are other uh, prognostic factors, but one of the most important and the most relevant for this talk is the patient's nodal status. In other words, do you have melanoma that's detected or felt in the lymph nodes? So the other fact that you need to know is that in the vast majority of patients who are newly diagnosed with melanomas, um, 84% or actually over 84% of patients actually have no evidence for any disease in their lymph nodes or in distant sites. So as Dr. Arian mentioned, the primary lesion is treated with wide local excision. But as we also heard, melanoma has a predilection for nodal spread as shown in this picture. Oh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Has a uh, predilection for nodal spread. Let me do this while you talk. Oh, thanks. I'm getting dressed by Dr. Aaron. <laughs> this is a great honor. Um, <laughs> as we just saw uh, in the, um, the prior slide, the vast majority of newly diagnosed patients have no evidence of enlarged nodes on clinical exam. So what's the... <laughs> Sorry, it's a little ticklish here. <laughs> I told you it's a <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> so what's the possibility for microscopic nodal spread? Something that you can't feel on clinical exam. So number one, can we detect this microscopic nodal metastasis? And two, what benefit does this provide in detecting microscopic nodal spread? So in the past, what we used to perform something very extensive, something called an elective lymph node dissection, which was routinely once performed to evaluate nodal status. And this involved removal of all the lymph nodes in the draining nodal basin. And in these patients, only about 20% were actually uh, found to harbor nodal disease. So many patients were actually unnecessarily exposed to the significant risks and morbidity of this extensive procedure without having any kind of proven survival benefit. So in 1992, Morton et al. actually reported on sentinel lymph node biopsy as a less invasive way to evaluate nodal status for patients with melanoma. And the hypotheses behind the development of this technique was that each area of skin in your body drained to specific lymph nodes, and that the first draining node of the primary, which is known as the sentinel nodes, would be the first to most likely harbor any nodal metastases. And by assessing these central nodes, you can determine the status of the entire nodal basin. So what does this involve? Well, first we inject localizing agents into the skin around the tumor. These localizing agents then accumulate in the fluid around the tumor and drain via lymphatics into the regional nodes. And then these localizing agents accumulate not only these first nodes, which then are traced intraoperatively. So what are some of the localizing agents that we use? Well, one is a radio tracer. And when we utilize this agent, we oftentimes obtain something called lymphocentigraphy, which is um, a picture that's taken after the radio tracer is injected and provides us a roadmap into knowing what are the drainage patterns that we see. So if a primary lesion is injected, we may say drainage into the axilla as shown in this, in this picture. We also utilize that radio tracer in the operating room using something called a, a gamma probe, which is a handheld probe that we utilize to locate central nodes that pick up the radio tracer. The other localized agent we'll utilize is something called a vital blue dye, which there are various agents. And we use this in the operating room uh, once we make an incision to look for blue lymphatic channels and use that to trace back to the blue lymph node, which are the central nodes as shown in this picture. So the studies have shown that when you utilize these radio tracers in different combinations, you can identify a central lymph node in about 97 to 99% of cases, so vast majority of cases. So how about the efficacy and value of this procedure? Well, this was shown in the big trial called the Multicenter Selective Lymphatic Retrial Number 1, or MSLT1. And essentially, this trial randomized patients between 
wide local excision and just observation node basins and wide local excision with central node biopsy. And what they found was that in about 16% of intermediate thickness uh, melanoma cases, you had a positive central lymph node, which increased to about 32% when you had a thick melanoma. And the 10-year follow-up survival data was actually just recently reported. So one of the biggest things that came out of this study was data to show that the survival of patients differed significantly based on central lymph node status, whether you had melanoma in your lymph nodes or you did not, in both the intermediate thickness and thick groups, as shown by the separation of these curves, which were significant. Also, when they looked at predictive modeling, um, they uh, found that whether or not your central lymph node contained melanoma was actually the most powerful predictor of recurrence and death from melanoma in the intermediate thickness group. So what this procedure actually provides is crucial staging information and provides significant prognostic information in the intermediate thickness groups. The other thing the, uh, the study showed was that central lymph node biopsy identified patients who would later recur with nodal disease and subsequently need a nodal dissection in patients who did not get treated with, um, uh, or who were treated with just wide local excision alone. So, some other data points here. So, what about the false negative rate of central node biopsy? In other words, the procedure is saying that, no, there's no melanoma in your nodes, but you actually really do have melanoma. In other words, the test is not correct. Well, the range for the rate of a false negative is pretty wide, but when you condense it down and look at an estimated, um, or I'm sorry, a weighted false negative rate, it actually reduces down to something fairly low to about 12.5%. And how about the complication rate from central node biopsy? Well, this procedure is very well tolerated, um, and complications are, uh, are relatively infrequent. And when we look at the MSLT1 data, when you add everything all up, it's approximately 10%. And from the Sunbelt Melanoma trial, it's about 5%. So it's about a 5 to 10% rate overall. So what can we say? So for intermediate thickness melanoma patients, and this was the primary group that was evaluated, central lymph node status uh, provides powerful prognostic information. You have an overall positive central lymph node rate of about 15-20%, and this procedure identifies patients who would ultimately require or should have a node dissection, and spares no negative patients the morbidity of a lymphadenectomy or a lymph node dissection. The false negative rate is low at about 10-15%, to 15%, and the complication rate is also low at about 5 to 10 percent. And the other thing to note is that because we harvest a lower number of lymph nodes, we can more rigorously evaluate each of those nodes for any melanoma. So how about if your melanoma is greater than 4 millimeters, a thick melanoma? So there is some controversy over whether or not we should use this procedure uh, in this population. Part of the issue is that about 30 to 40 percent of patients with thick melanomas will ultimately develop systemic disease. So staging the regional nodes may have some limited utility. Uh, but on the other end, for patients who never develop disease uh, systemically, staging the regional nodes may actually provide benefit because about 25 to 40 percent of these patients will actually have central lymph node metastases. So lots of studies have been done on this. As shown by those studies highlighted in red, the majority, the vast majority, have actually shown that there is a, a significant survival difference based on your central lymph node status. So central lymph node biopsy, even in this population, does provide important prognostic information. It also allows for evaluation of, for entry into clinical trials, and it allows for regional disease control at the microscopic level. So how about on the other end, patients with thin melanomas, melanomas up to one millimeter? Well, this is a big issue because about 70% of all newly diagnosed uh, melanoma cases are actually thin melanomas. And most of these patients have a very, very good survival with 10-year survival rates of over 90%. But there's controversy about using central node biopsy in these patients because only a subset, about 5 to 10 percent, actually develop regional recurrences, and it's those patients who may actually benefit from this procedure. On the other side, this has a low incidence of nodal metastases, and there's actually uncertain prognostic value to this procedure. Uh, there have been a lot of studies trying to determine prognostic factors, but there's no consensus. Now this slide is very busy. The, the purpose of this slide is to show you that there are a lot of studies that have been done on this, and this slide basically shows you the um, 
the more recent studies have reported on predictive factors for a positive sentinel lymph node. And you can see that the factors are scattered everywhere. But when you take a deeper look at this, most of the factors actually cluster around thickness, Clark level, ulceration, mitotic rate. And in particular, a thickness greater than or equal to 0.75 millimeters actually is the most reliable factor to predict for at least a 5% risk for nodal metastasis. So, what are the guidelines that have been published at this point? Um, SSO, ASCO, and the NCCN have all published these guidelines and basically recommend sentinel node biopsy for patients with intermediate thickness melanomas at any anatomic site. And for patients with thick melanomas, the procedure can be recommended for staging purposes and to facilitate regional disease control. However, in patients with thin melanomas, there's insufficient data to support routine use of sentinel node biopsy, but it can be considered in patients who are considered high risk. But of course, as we talked about, what constitutes high risk is debated. So just the last three, four slides here. So I wanted to just also bring up uh, completion nodal dissection, which is basically a lymph node dissection that's performed to remove the rest of the lymph nodes in a draining nodal basin when you have a positive central lymph node. This is considered the gold standard for any patient with a positive central lymph node. And the SSO, ASCO, and NCSAN guidelines all recommend this. And the primary reason for this is for regional disease control. In other words, we want to make sure we get all that melanoma out that may be in a nodal basin. And the reason is that the rate of finding additional nodes beyond your positive central lymph node can be anywhere roughly between 15 to 20 percent, as, as shown by the data on this slide. The other reason is that there's data for MSLT1 to suggest that if you have a nodal dissection for microscopic disease, i.e. a positive central lymph node, compared with having a lymph node dissection when you have a large node with you know, a lot of melanoma in it, the rate of developing chronic swelling of an extremity, extremity, something called lymphedema, is actually significantly less. So the morbidity may actually be less for this procedure. So, on the other side of this whole argument, about 80 to 85 percent of positive central lymph node patients will have no additional nodal disease outside of their central node uh, metastases, and about 70 to 80 percent of those patients will only have one node with nodal disease. And the survival benefit from doing this procedure is actually unknown. So the question arises, well, does every positive central lymph node uh, patient actually need to have a nodal dissection? Well, there's an ongoing trial called MSLT2, which is trying to answer this question. The accrual for this trial is completed, but the data and the results will not be available for a couple more years. So in summary, central lymph node biopsy is recommended for intermediate thickness melanomas and may be recommended for patients with thick melanomas. It can also be considered for thin melanoma patients uh, who have high-risk features, but as we mentioned, what constitutes high risk is debated. Central node status is prognostic for survival. And third, until the results of MSLT2 are available and other trials that are assessing this, completion nodal dissection is recommended for a positive central lymph node. Thank you. Okay. Now, um, we're going to have about half an hour at the end of the symposium for questions and answers. But in, in the meantime, as we're ready to take a break, I think we can take about 10 minutes or so to answer any questions right now for what's been presented so far. And we'll still have time later on to go over some questions. Yes, ma'am. Now, let me warn you. I have hearing aids in. <laughs> so I need for you to talk loudly on the microphone. Go ahead. My question is about the false negative lymph node, a sentinel node. Yes. How, do you, how long before you know it's really not negative? Uh, do we have one of the microphones? Uh, why don't you come on up here? Uh, Dr. Hahn will answer that question. That's a very good question. So number one, uh, to, to go back to the original studies on central lymph node biopsy, you know, the 
initial studies were concerned about that possibly. Like, did we actually miss the central node? Does you know nodal metastases actually occur somewhere else and not the sun in the central node that you actually picked up? That's what we call a skipped metastasis. So what they did actually to evaluate that, they would perform the central node biopsy in these clinical trials and then at that same surgery remove the rest of the lymph nodes. And they would see how often you would have a negative central node and actually have melanoma still in the rest of the lymph nodes. And that occurred in less than 2% of cases. So the procedure was very reliable. The false negative rate is based on basically, uh, you know, the way that we calculate the false negative rate. To answer your uh, question, the median time for recurrence for basically, or in other words, for melanoma coming back in your lymph nodes after you have a negative central node biopsy is about 6 to 12 months, okay? Now, uh, that can vary based on other parameters. So if you have a thicker lesion, that time frame can actually shorten quite a bit. Or if you have a thinner lesion, that can actually lengthen. But the median time is somewhere between about 6 to 12 months. OK. I'm going to start with some simple um, answers. So with one question, uh, Jonathan, is how often should I see a dermatologist for a body exam? If I have melanoma, as opposed to if I don't have melanoma, just a neighbor. Mm -hmm. So if you have melanoma, a recent melanoma, I would say every uh, four to six months. But sooner, if you find a new lesion that you're worried about, don't just wait for your six-month visit. If the day after the dermatology visit, you find something on yourself that maybe would have been missed. And if you don't have melanoma, but you may have some of the risk factors that I alluded to, then you might consider going once a year. Okay, so another question is, does the location of the melanoma have a bearing on the possible movement to a lymph node? I presume the question is increasing the probability of lymph gland involvement. And probably not. Um, think of it this way conceptually. Um, every time we develop a cancer, and that's true of any cancer, the only safe place for those cancer cells is in the original cluster. And while it's going through its division rates and the 30 doublings, cancer cells are getting into the lymph vessels and they're going to the lymph glands, they're getting into the blood vessels and going to different parts of the organ. But the only place the cell is safe is in the original cluster. Once it leaves and it gets in the bloodstream or lymph vessel, that's a hostile environment for the cancer cells. And it's most likely going to be killed. Probably over those two, three, four, five years until we get the diagnosis, this has been going on and it's being destroyed by the body. If we see a cancer in a lymph gland, what it tells us that I can tell you specifically for melanoma because it's the most immunogenic of all the cancers, meaning that we develop an immunity to it. So if we take cancer patients and draw blood from their arm, and we take their white blood cells from the test tube, 90% of those patients, their white blood cells, will kill human melanoma cells in tissue culture. Now, if we see a cancer in a lymph gland, that's headquarters for the immune system. It's like soldiers from an opposite army coming into the headquarters. Most likely, they should be destroyed. So why did they survive? What we presume is happening is there's a mutation, and those cancer cells have changed the surface protein. Think of the cancer cells as red coats. And the immune system is out to kill all cells with red coats on it. If one of them changes to a blue coat and it gets to the lymph gland, those immune cells are going to kill all the red coats. They see one with a blue coat. It's not their order. They leave it alone. And if it makes copies of itself, those copies will be blue, and that's when we see that there's melanoma in the lymph gland. We can take care of that. But what it tells us, if you have a cell that got to your lymph gland that developed into a blue coat, what's the possibility that something that got in your bloodstream maybe three years ago went to an organ and is lying dormant there, maybe that also had changed the blue and may show up. So it's a reflection of probabilities. I hope that answers that question. Uh, I'm sorry? Doctor, with regard to amelanonic disease, I know that there's a difference with regard to its uh, observation, sometimes delayed because it disguises itself because it is amelanonic. 
But my question is with regard to morbidity. Have there been any studies shown that amelanotic tumors increase or even decrease, or is there no difference whatsoever in the expected morbidity over a long period of time? Good question. Um, Mario, are you here? Okay let, me answer, oh, okay, let me answer that question for you. The data seems to show there's no difference. It's based on the thickness and ulceration. All, all that means is that amelanotic melanomas may actually grow longer before the diagnosis is made, and therefore the probability it'll actually grow deeper is greater. So the probability that lymph gland involvement may be greater, but only because of the delay in diagnosis, and maybe more than one, two, or three years. But thickness for thickness, there's no difference between them. Okay? Um, any question from the audience? Um, okay, if immunotherapy works to kill melanoma in the body, is there any evidence that shows that this will reduce the risk of getting a second primary melanoma? Well, what we do know is that the probability of anyone developing melanoma in the population today, male or female, is a slight difference, about 2 to 3 percent. Once we get the melanoma, the probability of getting a second primary melanoma, not a metastasis, but a brand new one, is about 10 percent. Now, the patient can still have normal immune responses. But the probability that some cell becomes malignant and protects itself and grows again is the same. So it's about a 10% probability. Okay? Now, with basal cell and squamous cell, it's just the opposite. 90% of the patients who 